Does the war in Ukraine matter to Africa? The simple answer is yes. And there are several good reasons for this. Vitaly Klitschko made 12 successful title defenses as the world heavyweight boxing champion. Today, though, he is the mayor of Kyiv. This is his message for politicians. You can't be half pregnant. Right now the world, black and white. Are you for peace and support Ukraine or you support aggressors, Russians? The mayor of Lviv, Andriy Sadovy, has a message for Africa. He says you can make a choice, money or freedom. My proposal, he says, and my choice is for freedom. If you choose money, you lose freedom. Russian President Vladimir Putin launched a blitzkrieg, which he euphemistically called Special Military Operation, to invade Ukraine. He thought he could quickly remove its leadership. But he soon learned that fighting strength is made up in more than just equipment and numbers. As the strategist Karl von Klosowitz observed, there's a difference between war and paper, or ideal war, and war in reality. The will to fight and resolve count just as much, perhaps more. That is the certainty on which development is built in Africa as much as in Ukraine. Several immediate military lessons stand out. The first of these immediate lessons from this campaign is it's not the size of the dog in the fight as ever that counts, but the fight in the dog. The Ukrainians have learnt well the lessons of the 2014 war with Russian-backed forces in the Donbass. One of these has been to allow the commanders on the ground the authority to make decisions and act with flexibility as the circumstances have demanded. They are also not seeking to hold territory, but rather to absorb the Russian invasion and then conduct hit-and-run attacks on stretch supply lines. A related lesson is that people's defence works if mobilised with the proper motivation and training. And we saw this at the start of the war when the Russians failed quickly to seize the strategic Antonov airport just 10 kilometres from Kiev. That while they eventually captured that facility, the Ukrainian resistance delayed Russian plans of a quick capitulation of Kiev, and it was a metaphor for what was to come in the next few weeks. A further lesson is in the limits of tank warfare, at least against modern anti-tank weapons and a determined enemy. As one commander reminded to me, Enlaw, the UK weapon, and Javelin, the US weapon, don't fight by themselves. People are fighting, but the combination, he said, of unconventional tactics and hyper-precision weapons have led to, as he termed it, amazing results. At the very least, tanks need infantry support. A lesson that has also been relearned here is that intelligence is a critical enabler of military actions, but it's also a valuable foreign policy tool. We don't know the exact extent of Western intelligence assistance to Ukraine, but one must assume that it is a critical factor in understanding and identifying Russian movements and control of the battle space in air, sea and land. A further lesson is that logistics as ever rule battles. One Ukrainian commander reminded of the words of Napoleon that the line between disorder and order lies in logistics. And these long lines of Russian convoys that we see on our television screens illustrate, if nothing else, that you need plenty of training to make these operations work. There are other lessons too which may become clearer over time, not least that stamina and patience can be a formidable warrior. And perhaps most importantly in this conflict, the media is a further important dimension of modern warfare. The contemporary battlefield is a transparent backdrop to leadership where the use of media and a suitable narrative can make all the difference. And finally, related to this, the political setting and leadership direction is crucial. We know from this campaign and from others, think of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, for example, that those who live on fear are more likely to be misled by their commanders. 
This type of leadership also suppresses innovation and flexibility and improvisation, which together, as we have seen in Ukraine, can be a game changer on the battlefield. Africans recognize the power of closer regional, political and economic integration, whether this be to pick up the humanitarian pieces or for longer-term economic prosperity. In the case of Europe, this has its roots in dark history, yet has produced unparalleled levels of cooperation. One of the extraordinary features of the Ukrainian war has been just how quickly the region has mobilized support for Ukrainians who have fled the conflict. In the first three days of the war, about 50,000 people a day came through the Medinka Gate into Poland, and Polish citizens very quickly embraced them, providing food, shelter, clothing, and other essential attributes to get them through and on their way into central Poland, where about three million Ukrainian refugees were by week five of the war housed, and elsewhere uh, throughout Europe and other places of the world. Within five weeks, nearly 10 million Ukrainians were on the move, four million outside and six million internally. Of course, this brings the war home to Europe. It brings the war home to the rest of the world, saying this is not just a struggle about Ukraine. This is a struggle for Europe, and it's a struggle for Europe beyond just being a geographic concept to Europe being a set of values. These individual canteens were, even by week six of the war, doing 500 meals a day. The West has in the process made up for the weakness and subsequent loss of credibility shown in the chaotic retreat from Afghanistan in 2021 by backing the Ukrainians, imposing punitive sanctions with a speed and certainty unheard of in modern European politics. NATO, Europe and the United States have shown leadership of the sort that Putin appeared to think was a thing of the past. It is this premium of leadership which seems to have been one of the greatest differentiators in this campaign. Think only of the contrast between Putin, in carefully choreographed appearances, with those of his Ukrainian opponent, President Vladimir Zelensky, unshaven, in his battle dress epitomizing Ukrainian resistance to the invasion and drawing in foreign support. He has become the face of Ukraine and the model of leadership. A Chachilian figure of the 21st century, a master of the quotable quote, who will forget, I need ammo, not a ride. Ukraine continues to resist because it has something worthwhile to fight for. As President Zelensky has put it in the face of the Russian setbacks, we believe in victory. This is our home, our land, our independence. It's just a question of time. People power is the secret to Ukraine's resistance, and this is founded on a depth of national identity and integrity. Indeed, what this war represents may be central to answering why it occurred at all, and why now, and it represents a further shared interest with Africa. While Africa and Ukraine are on different continents, they share an abhorrence for colonialism. Africa's guerrilla struggles against colonialism ties in with Ukraine's strong desire not to be subjugated and show the power of local forces even when fighting a far greater colonial power. It might take decades, but in the end, no force defeats the desire of a people to live in freedom and with economic progress. This is why 27 African countries voted to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine while only 17 abstained. Those countries that voted against or abstained from voting for the two UN resolutions condemning Russia's invasion are on the wrong side of history. This is not because they failed to condemn the violent transgression of international law or that the Russians have perpetrated acts of violence against civilians on a scale last seen in World War II or Korea. The Ukrainians are, after all, not bombing and shelling themselves. But it's because this war represents a struggle between two different value systems and the choices they offer. Norway illustrates this difference more starkly than the transformation undergone by Central and Eastern Europe since the end of the Cold War. A war that maintained a division between free and unfree political and economic systems, 
most notably in the case of East and West Berlin, where a war was established to keep people in the East Bloc. As Valeria, a software engineer from Donetsk, asks of these 40 countries that did not vote against Russia in the UN, what stops them from being next? Poland, too, was in many aspects the catalyst for these changes 30 years ago. Poland's economic transformation since 1990, since the end of the Cold War, has been extraordinary. Its per capita income has gone from just $1,700 in 1990 to over $15,000 today, from 40% of the global average to nearly 150% today. And this is down to an openness to trade, to technology, to skills and to global markets, the likes of which we see at this Eratopolis in Zhezha, just across the Ukrainian border. Lech Walesa, the solidarity leader who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1983, was elected president of Poland in 1990, led the struggles. He is not exaggerating when he says, by knocking the teeth out of the Soviet bear, we helped other nations win their freedom. But this was not an easy path for freedom. It's very easy to go from capitalism to communism. We just have to redistribute and give it to others, says Walesa. It is easy to make a fish soup out of an aquarium, but the other way around, from communism to capitalism, he says you have to create a fish pond out of a soup. Despite the challenges, these reforms have replicated throughout former East Bloc countries in their transition from Soviet rule to today's modern economies. It is notable that the countries that voted with Ukraine in the UN represent over 71% of global economic wealth, those that abstained, 23%, and the five that voted against, just 2%. Yet, these 140 countries that are with Ukraine comprise just 40% of the world's population, showing, if nothing else, that whatever the setbacks that liberalism has to continuously contend with, economic choices matter. It is this system that Ukrainians and many Russians crave and that Putin's Russia fears. It is the system that strongmen everywhere dread since it challenges rule by elites and oligarchs. Putin's system, which put power and privilege above people, has been uprooted by this war and the sanctions which have followed. It's really little surprise then that Ukraine would want to join the European Union, given that its GDP of $35,000 per capita is 10 times that even of a pre-war Ukraine. It was a combination of the choice of European integration over Putinism and a large dose of Ukrainian patriotism which gave rise to the Euromaidan protests in 2014. This set Ukraine on a collision course with Russia as it struggled to shake off Russian interference and clientelism, foreign factors of which African states are all too familiar. This clash of systems and values also helps to explain why now. It may even be partly explained by his misreading of Ukrainian and Western political resolve. The latter group, which Putin has caricatured as an empire of lies. It might also be because Russia is changing too, from the inside out. Its demographics mean that by 2030, Russia's current population of 143 million people is estimated to fall by 10%. It's the composition of this population that is also shifting, which will have an impact on Russia's political and social landscape. Today, over 20% of Russian population was born after 1992, after the fall of the Soviet Union. By 2032, that population will be nearly half of all Russians. This generation is unlikely to remain supportive of nostalgic glories, especially if the Russian economy declines. Sasa Masak was born in Lviv in Ukraine 180 years ago. He is the creator of the term masochism. One might think it's a useful metaphor for Ukraine today, a country taking on one of the largest and most powerful nations on earth in order to be able to assert their rights. But they would say they have no option. It's a process of self-determination, self-determination of their freedoms, self-determination 
of their choices and one that Africans should too be thinking about in those sorts of terms. It is not only close out regional integration in which Ukrainians see great future. For the meantime, they've learned quickly to use their assets to their best advantage, integrating closely their administrations, both civilian and military, recognizing and addressing the levels of corruption and poor governance that has plagued their progress since independence, another echo with Africa. Africans should, of course, do what is in Africa's best interest, including on Russia and the Ukraine. Ukraine's triumph of self-determination would be a victory for those interested in reform and on checks and balances on political authority and for those who seek economic openness as a conduit for trade and wealth. For those Africans wanting prosperity over poverty, Ukraine's freedom of choice matters. For the two-thirds of Africans who support democracy over other versions of government, Ukraine's survival as an independent and democratic nation is in their interests. For those Africans interested in sovereign stability, standing up for Ukraine's right to exist is in their interests. This is no less than Africans would expect from others in their time of need. The ambassador of Ukraine to South Africa, Lyubov Abravitova, has called for support from African countries. I'm sure you have seen pictures of Bucha on the outskirts of my capital city, Kiev. The bodies of hundreds of civilians, many of them summarily executed by Russian troops with their hands tied behind their backs, lie over the town. Africa has a special obligation to join us in telling the Russian invaders, enough is enough. This war cannot continue. In so doing, Africans should support peace. And Africa has to do what is in Africa's financial interests. The net effect of strangling Ukraine's corn, wheat, and sunflower exports, in which it is in the top five worldwide, will have dramatic and costly implications for African food security, especially on countries in North Africa. This is not a case of being pro-Ukraine, China, Russia, no NATO, it is just being pro-African. In this history, we are all Ukrainians. Slava Ukraini! Slava Ukraini!